Hey students, this is Mrs. Hernandez. Um, even if you already watched a version of this lesson in class this week, I still want you to rewatch this lesson because several of you are just missing a few important things that I think one more, uh, one more time around the block with the lesson will help fix it for you. So uh, this is a lesson to introduce you to our third argument paragraph this term, uh, which will be written on the play Trifles by Susan Glassfell. So first, we did an argument that was personal, not about literature. And then second, we did an argument about a short story uh, called Lather and Nothing Else. And that short story was really straightforward with in terms of the claim. This story, Trifles, that we're doing an argument paragraph on now, is a little less straightforward. The prompt or the question that you're being asked to write your argument paragraph on is a little more ambiguous. So this is a little bit more challenging than the first literary piece. And the reason that this is challenging is because it's, it's, uh, you're being asked to say whether or not the character's choice was morally correct and then finding evidence about that, which is just a little bit more complex. But no matter what thing we're writing about, for argument writing, the argument writing process is always the same. Can you use evidence to support your opinion and acknowledge somebody else's opinion, but still say that you're right? That's what an argument is. So remember, every time you're writing an argument of any kind, whether it's a paragraph or an essay or however you want to do it, it should always include a strong claim, your opinion, and then supporting evidence, basically you saying, here's why my opinion, my claim is correct. Then it should include a counterclaim saying, now I have my own opinion and I understand why you might disagree with that opinion. And then a rebuttal saying, but even though you might disagree with my opinion, my opinion is still right. So really the argument paragraph really just has four basic steps. Here's my opinion, here's why it's right, Here's why you might think it's wrong, but here's why I'm still right. Just four steps. The checklist that we have kind of breaks those four steps down into sub skills. So you have more guidance on what I need to see from you. But really any argument just follows these same four steps. So always keep that in mind. So again, we've written about ourselves. We've written about literature. Now we're going to take it one step further with argument writing to write about a more complex piece of literature. And in this case, it's a play by Susan Glassbell. But the checklist for this assignment is still the same. This is going to be the last practice argument paragraph before our benchmark, before our big test argument paragraph. But this checklist is the exact same checklist that you'll be expected to follow for your big benchmark test. So again, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm trying to give you all the information you need to be successful and practice all of those steps before you even get to the test, right? So keep in mind that this checklist involves uh, big steps broken down into smaller steps. So the first big step of any piece of writing, especially argument writing, is to pre-write it, which means before you begin writing the actual paragraph, you need to outline and think through your argument, meaning decide what your claim is going to be, make sure it's a strong claim, decide what your evidence will be, make sure that that textual evidence is strong and directly supports your claim, write all that down, then decide what your counterclaim is gonna be, find evidence for the counterclaim, and make sure you write all of that down before you begin writing so you have an outline uh, as you write and your writing doesn't get away from itself. Next, you need to make sure that there's an introduction and a claim in your paragraph. And in this case, when we're dealing with a piece of literature, in that introduction, we need to make sure to include all of the important information about that piece of literature. So you must always include the title of the text, the author's full name, and the type of the text. The title of the text has to be formatted correctly in MLA formatting, which means that every word of the title, the first letter of every word is capitalized, and it's either going to be italicized or in quotation marks. So for Lather and Nothing Else, it was a short story that belonged in quotation marks without being italicized. But since Trifles is a play that is a larger work, 
it is italicized and not in quotation marks, but it should never be both quotation marks and italicized. It should never be both. It should just be one or the other. I have a handout for you. Um, I've given it to you in paper form, but it's also on can Canvas that tells you how to format titles in MLA. So if you're not sure how to format a title in MLA, make just go over that handout. You should have it on paper form and on Canvas. Um, all, the author's full name, you need to make sure to spell the author's full name correctly always. Um, you'll use the author's full name the first time you introduce the piece of writing. And then if you're going to refer to the author after that in your paragraph, just refer to them by their last name, Glassbell. And then the text type is whether or not it's a play or a novel or a poem or a short story. And in this case, Trifles is a play. It's a short play, but it's a full play. Um, so the way that your introduction would sound for this piece of writing would be something like in the play comma trifles comma by susan glassbell comma a group of women engage in deception right so here is our introductory sentence it tells us everything we need to know about the piece of writing we're going to be referencing throughout our paragraph here's the text type it's a play here is the title of the text formatted correctly in mla it's italicized with the first letter capitalized, no quotation marks. Here's the author's name and a little bit about the work. That's all we need. And yes, there's a lot of commas in this sentence here, but trifles is an interrupter, inter interrupting phrase technically, and so is the author's name by Susan Glassbell. So each of those things need to go in commas. If you forget your commas, I'll have to mark you down for it but it but the most important thing is to make sure you have all these three components of your introduction then next you got to make a strong claim make a strong claim so the prompt for this piece of writing is whether or not it was okay for this group of women to deceive people whether or not it was morally okay morally right so your claim will be, yes, it was morally correct, or no, it was not morally correct. Don't try to make any wishy-washy. Don't try to say yes and no. Don't say it was sort of, kind of, or probably correct. Just make a strong claim and go with it. Make sure your claim directly answers the prompt and doesn't kind of veer off into some other land, right? Next, you need to have evidence. And when we're talking about literature, our evidence, there's a special term for it. It's called textual evidence. It just means that you're giving me evidence to support your claim. You're giving me evidence directly from the piece of writing. So you're going to give me two pieces of evidence from trifles. And now you can paraphrase this evidence, just mention it, or you can use a, a direct quote as evidence, direct quote from the play as evidence. At least one of your pieces of evidence needs to be a direct quote. The other one can be a paraphrase or you can just have everything be a quote, whatever you need, whatever you'd like, but you need to have at least one quote in there because I need to see that you know how to properly cite and punctuate a quote in MLA. Then make sure that your evidence directly supports your claim. Don't bring in stuff that's not really supporting what you're trying to say. And make sure you give context for each piece of evidence, provide background, who they're talking to, where they are, what are they talking about? And make sure that you, on each piece of evidence, before you move on to each piece of evidence, you, before you move on to a second piece of evidence, you introduce your evidence, give me the evidence, like quote it, and then explain why that evidence is important and how it connects to your claim. Don't move on to another piece of evidence until you have introduced the evidence, given me the evidence, explained the evidence and how it connects to the claim. Don't move on until you do those three things for every piece of evidence. Um, now, a good way to remember these three things that you need to do to introduce a quote or any piece of evidence is what I call a quote sandwich. There is a handout for this that I will have given you in person, but it's also on Canvas. Um, just look for quote sandwich page in our Canvas module. But there's a good way to remember anytime you're introducing a quote from a work or even paraphrasing a part of a work, you have to follow the quote sandwich pattern. And all of this pattern, it always needs to be done in this specific order. If you're not quite sure about this, 
Um, I have a few videos on the resources module in Canvas. I'll show you that at the end of this video. But it always follows this exact order. So for the top button, or the first thing you need to do when you introduce a quote, is tell me who, what, where. Just the basics. It doesn't even have to be a full sentence. It could be, you know, the sheriff said to the people in the barn, right? You're saying who, what, and where, right? The sheriff said to the people in the barn, then give me the thing that the sheriff said, the direct quote. And anytime you directly quote, you need to make sure to cite it. We'll talk about that in a second. So you introduce it just very briefly, give me the quote. And then this is the most important part of this pattern. Then you explain to me not only what the quote means, but how that quote connects and supports your claim. That's the important part. It's never complete unless you can explain why the quote matters. So again, you're introducing the quote. Just make an introductory statement. You're giving the reader a heads up about the fact that you're going to use a quote. Tell me who's talking, who they're talking to, and where they are, what the context is. It doesn't have to be elaborate. You don't need to retell me the whole entire story. Just give me a brief half a sentence on that. Then quote or paraphrase. So for example, this is a line from the text. I said, the county attorney tells the group, so that's saying who's speaking and who they're speaking to. That's my introduction. The county attorney tells the group, you put a comma after your introductory phrase, then start your quotation marks, capitalize the first word of their quote. And it's he, the, the county attorney says, I guess before we're through, she may have something more serious than preserves to worry about. Notice I don't have a period here. I've moved the period after my citation. And so this is my quote. I have put it in quotation marks. It's word for word. I've introduced it with an introductory phrase. I put a comma after that introductory phrase. But the most important thing here is this little thing in parentheses. And really it's what's called a parenthetical citation, but that's a fancy way of saying a citation in parentheses at the end of a quote. And this citation basically says, these are not your words, they're somebody else's words, and you're telling me whose words they are and where I can find them in the work. So in this case, I got this quote from Trifles by Susan Glassbell, and it was on page three of the play. So I take the author's last name, capitalize one, the first letter of their last name, and then tell me what page it was on. That's all you need to do. Um, it needs to be in parentheses, no comma right here, a space between the name and the page number, and then your punctuation that was right here at the end of the sentence in the text. I, I didn't get rid of it, I just moved it until after the citation because the citation is part of the sentence. So that's what we should do for every MLA, but in case you need a quick review of that, here's another quote. The sheriff tells the group there is nothing suspicious in the kitchen saying, here's my comma, there's my introductory phrase, a little context. So I've introduced it. Here's the quote, nothing here but kitchen things. And then, sorry, the formatting was off for this slide. <laughs> it was beautiful and perfect, but um, when I turned it into presentation mode, the formatting's off. But keep in mind that there should be no comma right here in the citation. The period does not go after the quote, it goes after the citation, but the quotation marks, they stay around the quoted words. Notice the word, the first word of the quote is capitalized. And um, oh yeah, I, I did say this, no comma right here after the author. So that's really how it should look. Sorry, this page did not work as well as I had hoped, you know, the best laid plans. Um, but keep in mind, the most important thing after you introduce the quote and you give the quote, you need to explain to me why it matters. Explain to me why that what that quote means and how that quote supports your original claim. And then our favorite, the counterclaim. So once you've introduced your two pieces of evidence, you've supported those two pieces of evidence, explained them and connected them to the claim. Now you're gonna tell me why somebody might disagree. So you're gonna say, one might think that it was not okay for the women to deceive others because so remember, you need one new piece of textual evidence to support your counterclaim, which means you have two pieces of evidence to support your claim, and a third piece of evidence needs to be in your paragraph. But 
this third piece doesn't support your claim. It actually supports your counterclaim, right? You still need to use a piece of evidence from the text. You can either paraphrase or use a quote, but remember it needs to be cited correctly and punctuated correctly and still support and explain how that evidence supports your counterclaim, not your claim. So in your paragraph, you'll have three total pieces of evidence. Two pieces of evidence to support your claim, two pe one piece of evidence to support your counterclaim, three total. Then you'll have a concluding statement and it'll always follow the same pattern. You're gonna give a rebuttal to the counterclaim. The counterclaim said, I understand why people might disagree, but this is your rebuttal, but my claim is still right because just rephrase your original claim and then end with a beautiful mic drop concluding statement, a great way to end your paragraph. Make sure you leave the paragraph with a beautiful last line. And then you're not done until you go back after you've written this beautiful paragraph, you should write a unique title for that paragraph that clearly supports your claim. Please, for the love of all that is holy, do not title your beautiful paragraph, argument paragraph. Don't do that. It'll hurt my feelings. Title it something unique and beautiful and insightful. Remember that your conventions, which is the spelling, grammar, and punctuation, all of that needs to be on point. So make sure that if you are struggling with spelling, grammar, or punctuation, I have a resource module in Canvas that I'm going to show you at the end of this video that will hopefully help you with this spelling, grammar, punctuation stuff. Also remember the MLA page forming, formatting is still uh, being graded. And a lot of you, I could tell that you didn't watch the beautiful MLA video that I put together. So I will show you how to go back and watch that video, but I've also given you a piece of paper that has MLA formatting uh, settings on it. It should be in your binder. Um, also make sure that you're, now we're adding on with MLA where you need to properly format the title of your reference text, that's trifles. You need to properly format that in MLA and you need to punctuate and cite quotes from the text correctly in MLA. Again, I will show you in the resource library where you can find that. Also remember that formal writing rules apply to this paragraph. So it means that not only should you not use rhetorical questions, it's a fancy way of saying, don't ask questions in your formal writing, just make statements. Don't ever put a question mark. Um, no slang, non-standards words like a lot and gonna. And contractions, a lot of times students might not even know that they're making a contraction but remember instead of putting don't or can't or won't or isn't put do not cannot will not is not so anytime you're contracting two words together and making one word with that apostrophe don't do it uncontract those two words and use the two words separately it's just more formal and more proper and then also make sure that you're never ever writing in first person. So you should never say I, me, we, you, etc. You should be in third person perspective, which means you're removed from the situation. So you don't say, I think that the women were morally right to deceive. You would just say the women were morally right to deceive, right? So just make sure you're not using I, me, or we ever in, in formal writing. I'm gonna take you on a tour of a few things, the resource module, the information about this assignment, and also how to highlight your text. But I will say, we're adding on with this third argument assignment. So now that we have gotten the process down of argument writing, I'm going to ask you in your actual writing, in your actual paragraph, when you're writing it on a separate document, after you're done writing everything, following the checklist, before you turn in your paragraph, I'm gonna ask you to highlight in your actual writing according to this key. So I'm gonna ask you to, in the introduction, where you give me the author name, text type, and title, I'm gonna ask you to highlight that sentence in yellow. I'm gonna ask you to highlight your claim in pink. And I'm gonna ask you to highlight each of these things in a different color so I know what you think is your claim and your evidence and your background and your paraphrasing and your quote or so I know what you think these are so if I see some big differences between what you think is the connection and what I'm seeing at least we can address that a lot more clearly so again 
my goal in having you highlight here is not to just give you one more thing to do, but if I, if I know what you think you're doing, then that will help me know how to help you better. So before you turn in this assignment, make sure after you've written it, it should still be in MLA formatting. It should still all be beautiful, but you're going to go through and highlight each part of your paragraph from this uh, outline here. You're going to go highlight each par part of your paragraph, these colors, so I know what you think you're doing, right? But one thing before we move on that's really important to note is that a lot of students try to give all their evidence at once, but remember for this paragraph, we're giving one piece of evidence and sticking with just that one piece of evidence until we complete it. Then we're introducing the second piece of evidence. And to complete a piece of evidence, you have to give a little background, give the quote, expand or elaborate, then connect it back to your claim. Then introduce evidence number two, follow the same pattern with evidence number two, connect it back to the claim, then go into your counterclaim. So you're doing justice to each separate piece of evidence before you move on. Um, once you're done, once we're done with this little lesson here, before you write this assignment, I'm going to ask you to create an outline, just notes for yourself so you know what you're writing for this paragraph. So at the end of class, um, during the fourth week of school, I'm going to give you this actual paper and I'm going to ask you to complete it over the first part of week five and bring it completed to class during week five. And, I, and on week five, I believe it's September 23rd and 24th. You're gonna bring it completed to class. I will grade it in class, and then you'll use it in class to write your, oh, it's right here. Hello, the dates are right here. <laughs> Yikes. Um, you're gonna bring this outline to class and you're gonna write your argument paragraph in class. You're not gonna write this one at home. You're gonna write it in class and turn it all the way in. That's why I'm asking you to outline it before you come to class. So in class can just be spent writing your paragraph and then highlighting it so you can turn it in. So make sure that you complete this outline at home and bring it completed to class because it will be graded in class. And the whole point is to have it help you during your writing um, for this third argument paragraph. It's your final practice before the benchmark. So please, make sure that you complete this and, and don't skip this important step. Uh, and also make sure that you don't forget to bring your copy of trifles as well, because you'll need that to write your paragraph. Um, I have total and complete confidence with you, but what I do want to do is make sure that I show you a couple things on our English, our, on our course before we move forward. So um, here's our module for this week. We, before you come to class, you should have read and annotated the play trifles. Um, then you should have completed your MITS quiz and here's the information for that. But in class, we're gonna talk about this, this argument writing paragraph, but also here, here is the information for formatting quotes and titles in MLA if you need a reminder for that. Here's also the instructions for a quote sandwich or how to properly introduce a quote in writing. So all of that is there for you. And here is the outline for your trifles argument paragraph. Um, make sure you have the outline completed before you come to class during week five. But I do want to show you something really cool. If you go to say like you're on your, your dashboard, don't look from your dashboard, come to your courses and go to English 11 and you should see this page. If you go to modules for English 11 and you scroll all the way down past our weekly learning modules, you'll see right here a resource library for grammar convention style and other language arts skills. I've spent years putting this resource library together. Every single one of these little pages is full of information and videos to help you become a better English writer. But um, So for instance, this first section here is just MLA. There's page formatting instructions for MLA. Here is a video where you, where I explain you, explain to you directly how to format your page in MLA. A lot of, I, I noticed a lot of you did not watch this video because your page was not correctly formatted. Please go and watch this video in this module. It will really help you. There's a lot of other great MLA resources, um, MLA citation information. 
Um, also, there's some rules of formal writing information right here. How help with argumentative responses. If you're still not clear on this, there's there's talks, there's there's short little videos on claims, parts of an argument, counterclaims, um, tons of information there to help you if you need it. Um, also, how to incorporate quotes into your writing. In here, there's um, information about a quote sandwich right here. Several great quote sandwich tutorials. And we also have help with punctuation and grammar. So all of this is always open on Canvas. It's always here for you. Um, if you're struggling with parts, if you're struggling with, with English, basic English skills, it's all here in this module. And keep in mind that it's right below our weekly learning modules. It's right there, just scroll further down on our modules page. Um, one quick thing I also wanted to help you understand is say like you were, there should be a page number right here if you are turning this in in MLA. But uh, say like I was ready to turn in this paragraph for my argument paragraph number three. See, there's a contraction here. I shouldn't have that there. Yikes. Um, yikes. Um, here's what I want you to do. So according to the highlighting key that I will post in the room, um, you're going to highlight the different parts of your essay. So for instance, here's my title. I wanted you to have that in yellow. Here's the introduction. I wanted you to highlight that in yellow. I wanted you to highlight your claim in red. So here's how you go and make the different colors for highlighting. So I know what you think. Um, I know what you think is your claim, your evidence, your elaboration, so I can help you get a little clearer on your writing skills for argument writing. But this is how you will highlight stuff. You'll just go through and highlight the different parts of it according to the key that I give you. So uh, if you're wondering how to highlight, you just click in, in front of where you want to highlight, highlight the sentence or the full phrase that you want to highlight, lift up, go to this little highlighter uh, icon here, push the arrow, select the color that you want that portion to be, and move on to the next part. That's how you highlight. Um, hopefully, uh, you have a lot of confidence going forward in how to complete this assignment. And I wish you the best. I hope you're learning and, and feeling like you're learning some great skills here. But please, um, at the end of the day, I would love for you to just ask me questions if you have those questions, because I'm more than happy to help you and I want to see you do well. All right. Thanks for watching. Make sure you take the quiz right after this uh, video. Thanks. Bye.